We are now in hour two of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, in which we're going to address the creation and the fall of man. And let me just say <laughs> right at the outset, of all the sessions we're going to have, this one is undoubtedly the most frustrating. And it's not because of the biblical material, it's because of the presuppositions and prejudices we bring to this topic. Because we've all grown up in a pagan culture in which it, there's an enforced theory in science called evolution. And the myths and nonsense that gets promoted in our schools and throughout our culture are one of the things that we need to overcome. Our problem isn't the Bible, our problem is bad science, poor science. But let's just jump in. Uh, we obviously are in the Old Testament, and we're, we're in the first book of the Old Testament, the first book of the Torah, the five books of Moses, book of Genesis. And we obviously are in our panorama of history, we're going right at the beginning, the creation of time itself, not just the physical universe, but the creation of time itself. And uh, in this session, we're going to take three chapters, chapters 1 and 2, which deal with creation, and chapter 3, which deals with the predicament of mankind, the fall of man, and uh, what God is doing to respond to that. And uh, so this is hour two of the 24 hours. There are actually only two worldviews. There are lots of different views, but they really categorize into one of two categories. Either everything is the result of a cosmic accident, and this is what we're taught in the schools today, that we came from goo to you by way of the zoo, in other words. And uh, this idea of uh, uh, everything being the result of a cosmic accident uh, is ridiculous, of course, but also we, it shouldn't surprise us then that our children have no sense of destiny. And how can they have if we are all just some kind of cosmic accident? The alternative view, worldview is that we are the result of a deliberate and highly skillful design, which implies, of course, that there's a designer. And in turn, that implies there's an accountability to that designer. All the different worldviews you might categorize fall into one of these two categories. And these things are important issues because it will lead to four basic questions. Who am I? And uh, where did I come from? And why am I here? And where am I going to go when I die? These four basic questions are questions that every one of us has a belief about, an attitude about. And uh, it's critical, of course, because this will determine our destiny. It's interesting that the book of Genesis anticipates all false philosophies. Atheism is rebutted by the fact that we've been created by God. Pantheism, that the fact that God is everywhere, is nonsense. God is transcendent of His creation and distinguishable from it. Polytheism is rebutted in the book of Genesis. There is one God. And uh, materialism is rebutted in Genesis because matter had a beginning and it also will have an end. Humanism, which is of course God not man, is the ultimate reality. We're not the ultimate reality. We're simply pawns in a prize in a cosmic warfare. But God Himself is the ultimate reality. And of course, the other thing that lurks behind all our discussions is this theory of evolution. And when we speak of evolution or evolutionism, we're not talking about the fact that there is adaptation within species. It's really uh, what we're dealing with here is biogenesis. But we generally call it the theory of evolution. And that is, of course, rebutted by the Scripture because God deliberately and skillfully created each one of us. And uh, uniformism. Among scientists, there's an attitude that things have always been the way they are, that things continue as they always have been. And the Bible speaks differently. It says God intervenes, uh, not, if, you know, not only at the creation, but during history. He intervenes in what's going on. And it's interesting, when, if you take a pair of binoculars and look at the moon or in any other uh, uh, planetary objects, we see them bitterly beaten up, pockmarked. It's clear that the solar system was a rough neighborhood. And so uh, the uniformism is, is a suspect premise even within a scientific uh, uh, context. Every major doctrine in the Bible has its roots in Genesis. Sovereign election, salvation, justification by faith, the believer's security, uh, the concept of separation, the disciplinary chastisement, the rapture of the church is even suggested here, divine incarnation, death and resurrection, the priesthoods, both the Aaronic and the Melchizedek uh, priesthoods, 
The Antichrist even has his roots in here, and the Palestinian covenant, and on it goes. There are more than we could even list here. Let's just jump in and take the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if you can embrace that sentence, you'll have no problems in the rest of the Bible. If you have problems with that sentence, uh, you'll have all kinds of difficulties. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's interesting that in the Hebrew, it, there are uh, seven words and uh, 28 letters. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and by the way, you notice that Hebrew, remember, goes from right to left. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. Nations that were east of Jerusalem wrote from right to left. Nations that are west of Jerusalem write from left to right. And uh, so, uh, let's see, it's, uh, it, it, uh, Western Europe, we have Greek, Latin, uh, English, of course, and so on, Spanish, what have you, all go from left to right. If you go east of Jerusalem, whether it's Hebrew, Aramaic, Sanskrit, what have you, it goes from right to left. I don't know what you do with that piece of information, but I had to throw it out there. And uh, there are over 300,000 letters uh, in the Torah, but we're taking 28 of them here. And we actually could be spending a week of study uh, of, uh, on just this, uh, these letters. And uh, so notice the first word is Bereshit, in the beginning, or technically in beginning. And uh, then the word bara, in the beginning bara, God created out of nothing. There are three different words that c could be used here. Asa, which means to make or fashion, fabricate if you will, but of something else. Uh, yatsa, which means to form something. But these are not the words used here. The word bara means to create out of nothing. And uh, all three of these words are in Isaiah 43, 7. They each have obviously a different sense. But the other thing I'd like to comment on, without trying to uh, beat this to death, um, is the word Elohim, the word God there. Bereshit bara Elohim. The word Elohim, you, whether you realize it or not, probably know enough Hebrew to realize that that's a plural noun. Certain categories of Hebrew nouns uh, suggest the plural by an I-M ending. Cherub is singular, cherubim is plural. A seraph is singular, seraphim are plural. Uh, and Elohim is a plural noun. But what's strange about its usage in the Bible, it's always used as a singular noun. It technically is a grammatical mistake. And uh, it's a hint in the very structure of the first few words of the Torah of the Trinity. And we'll, the Trinity is all through the Old Testament, but that's a separate study, but just be sensitive to that. But <coughs> there are a number of basic questions. Is the universe 15 billion years old? That's the conventional wisdom among astronomers, of course, 15, 16 billion. And, uh, or was it created in six days, in 144 hours? How many of you here believe the universe is 16 billion years old? Okay, how many of you believe that the universe is, was created in literally six days? My hand is up in both cases. And that may surprise you, because both may be true. It always bothers me when I find Christians who are sophisticated in Einstein's theory of relativity badger this, because from Einstein's theory of relativity, you have to beg the question, of whose clock are you talking about? And I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. But there are many Christians that have trouble with the six-day concept. There's actually a large group of scientists that have published a book in six days, over 50 of them, exp expressing why they believe the universe was created in six days. Or was the light just created in transit? Were the aging factors built in, the tree rings that suggest more and so forth? Um, these things uh, are, are uh, an issue to many Christians because they want to cling to the idea of being scientifically accurate on the one hand, and yet they have, they're troubled by the fact the Bible says uh, clearly six days. Or were the days more than 24 hours? Were they actually geological eras? There are many uh, authors that write books trying to uh, present a Christian viewpoint uh, arguing that uh, there are, they try to make this 16 billion year age of the universe compatible with the scripture. The great discovery of 20th century science was that we live in a finite universe, which means it had a beginning. And the way they try to explain that beginning is with a family of theories called the Big Bang models, which essentially say first there was nothing and then it exploded. And that uh, may sound facetious, but that's literally what they say. The first one was the steady state model that Einstein himself admitted was his biggest mistake because it was discredited. 
Then there was a concept, a hesitation model, but that was refuted in the 1960s. Then there was an oscillation model that expanded and contracted and so forth, and that's refuted by the entropy laws and lack of mass and other issues. The current models are basically a variation of what they call the inflation model. The problem with this model, it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed. I won't uh, tear these all apart, but the whole Big Bang area is a, an area of continual adjustments and hypotheses and unprovable uh, theories and so forth. There's interesting, there is a stretch factor of the universe. It apparently is expanded to, by a, a factor of 10 to the 12th, according to conventional wisdom, which is based on the temperature of the quark confinement, when matter frees out energy, and I won't go into all of that. Namely, this 16 billion year life of the universe if it would be an expression uh, of the expansion factor. But what's interesting, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who is a, one of the world famous nuclear physicists, he participated in the atomic bomb tests and so forth. He has his residence in Jerusalem. He wrote a marvelous book called Genesis and the Big Bang. Now he's not a Christian, he's a Jew, brilliant scientist and uh, a, a delightful friend. Uh, we, we spent a Passover together in his home. But it's interesting, if you take that expansion factor of 10 to the 12th, the 16 billion years represent uh, essentially 6 billion billion uh, uh, days, or 10 to 6 to the 10 to the 12th days. And if you divide that by the expansion factor of 10 to the 12th, that's what you get. You get 6 days. To look at an exponential expansion, day 1 by this would, would account for 8 billion of those years, day 2, 4 billion, two, uh, third day, 2 billion, and so forth. The, the sum being uh, 16 billion years as measured. Um, at the uh, at the perimeter of the uh, of the universe, on a, on a, so the real question is whose clock are you talking about? Adam wasn't on the earth when this was created. The only clock around was God's, and God clearly tells us that it uh, is uh, uh, six days. We'll get to that shortly. But one of the things that we need to be sensitive to is that modern science has approached the very boundaries of our reality, and have recognized that, and uh, so. There are two concepts in mathematics, if you're in school, that you cannot find in the physical universe. One of them is randomness. We often talk about random numbers, but you'll discover if you're in the computer field, there's no such thing as a truly random number. You have pseudo-random generators that will generate numbers that have many of the properties of random numbers, but true randomness is an elusive concept. And uh, most of us have been trained with what's called deterministic models, uh, equa like equations, F equals MA or whatever as you learn in science. But there's another field of study of stochastic models in which the, the, the it includes random variables. The field of advanced statistics uh, would uh, be embraced by the, this area. And uh, if you really study this area, you discover that the best you can get are pseudo-random numbers. Randomness is an elusive concept. That leads to a new theory in mathematics called the chaos theory, which deals with these issues. But randomness is very elusive to actually find. Well, that's exactly what the Scripture says, by the way. It says the lot is cast in the, uh, into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And uh, so he's in control. And Albert Einstein said, God does not play dice. That was one of his rebuttals to some of these theories. And I always enjoy that because if God did play dice, the reason he doesn't play it, if he did, he'd win, right? So, uh, but moving on, the other concept that you cannot find in the universe, surprisingly enough, is infinity. We can conceive of it, we can deal with it mathematically, but we find it uh, uh, elusive. Um, in the macrocosm, the universe itself, you think by looking through a telescope, if it was good enough, you could see the, finally uh, see the fringe of the universe. The universe is finite, and it uh, is not infinite. That's one of the great discoveries of, of modern science. But at the microcosm, that is in the, in the area of smallness, we're also startled to discover there is a boundary to smallness. You and I would think that if we took a line and cut it in half, what we, we could take what's left and cut that in half again. And you would think, at least conceptually, you could do that forever. However small you get, whatever's left you could always cut in half. It turns out that's not true. There is a length, it happens to be 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, which if you cut it in half, it no longer has locality. Subatomic particles uh, 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 have a property that physicists call non-locality. The whole field of quantum physics is based on the discovery that whether you're talking about length or energy or mass or time, all these things are made up of indivisible units, things that you cannot split any, uh, any smaller. And uh, so we, are, we find ourselves then, as we examine these two boundaries, we are in a subset of a larger reality 
we're bounded by quantum physics on the small end and a limited cosmos on the large end. We are in a virtual reality of a larger universe. And uh, the Planck length turns out to be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters that you can't make get smaller than. Planck time, you cannot find a unit of time smaller than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Now, those are very small, but the point is they're indivisible. And that has profound implications in understanding our world. We are in a digital simulation. This, this podium looks, feels like it's solid. It actually is not by a factor of, of uh, 10 to the 15th, strangely enough. And we'll get into that in a moment. But the rea what we think is reality is actually a virtual reality within, in fact, a digital reality within a much larger context. And we, we, we can't see beyond our, our reality, but we know that we are a subset by uh, what we observe. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about physical chronometers. Uh, you know, the, uh, many of us talk about radiometric dating, carbon-14 dating and so forth. And the trouble with this form of dating, it's based on some assumptions. It's based on a known clock rate, that the clock was set accurately at the beginning, and the clock was not disturbed during the measure. And it turns out that these are frail assumptions to build long uh, estimates of time on. This leads to a whole division in science of uniformitarianism, which means things have always been the way they are, or catastrophism, that where we are as a result of past catastrophes, collisions, and so forth. And the evidence is all in favor of catastrophism. And all you have to do to convince yourself of that is get a pair of binoculars and take a look at the moon and explain how those craters and things happened by uniformitarianism. Now there's a number, it's astonishing to discover there are a number of indicators that indicate that our Earth is far younger than is commonly taught. The amount of moon dust, oil gushers, the Earth's magnetic field, the Mississippi River Delta, the salinity of the oceans, the pointing Robertson effect, I'll come back to that, and radio halos, and uh, these, these are just an example. There are 95 of these listed by Walt Brown in his books on, on, on evolution and so forth, and I, I encourage you to take a look at those. Let's talk about moon dust. See, the lunar surface is exposed to direct sunlight and strong ultraviolet light and x-rays. These can all destroy the surface layer of the exposed rock and reduce them to dust. And it does this at the rate of a few ten thousandths of an inch per year. But even this minute amount during the age of the moon could be sufficient to form a layer several miles deep. But that's uh, not what they find, of course. There's only a few thousand years worth of dust found. Sounds strange, but that's an indicator of the age of the moon. The Earth's magnetic field. Its half-life is calculated to be about 1,400 years. And based on measurements taken from 1835 to 1965, it also generates estimates of an age of the Earth of something less than 10,000 years. Now, if, extra if it extrapolated back 20,000 years, the joule heat generated would liquefy the Earth. So you're getting some real equations here to analyze that, def that uh, suggest, obviously, a young Earth. The Mississippi River Delta. There's approximately 300 million cubic yards of sediment that are deposited in the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River each year. Analysis of that volume and the rate of accumulation and dividing the weight of those sediments deposited annually, the age of the delta appears to be, guess what, about 4,000 years. The salinity of the oceans, uranium, sodium, nickel, magnesium, silicon, potassium, copper, gold, molybdenum, and bicarbonate concentrations in the oceans are much less than would be expected if these elements and compounds were being added to the oceans at the present rate for thousands of millions of years, as is commonly taught in our schools. Nitrates and uranium do not break down or recycle like salt does. And so that's, uh, as you get into the details here, they're, they're, they're rather telling. This all implies that our oceans are a few thousand years old. There's another uh, uh, effect, the pointing uh, Robertson effect. You might look at it like a solar janitor. It may help you remember it. Photons, these subatomic particles, slow down the forward movement of objects in space. They eventually they, they collide with these. They're very small particles, but they're still real particles. The solar drag force exerted upon micrometeoroids causes the particles to spiral into the sun. Because they slow down, they eventually get attracted by the sun's gravity. The sun is sweeping space at the rate of about 100,000 tons per day. And there's no known source of replenishment. And so the current abundance speaks again for a young universe. And so uh, there's also what they call radio halos. Primordial polonium-218 has been found 
in mica and fluorite. You say, so what? Well, polonium-218 has a half-life of only three minutes. And uh, so this is evidence of an instantaneous crystallization of the host granite concurrent with the formation of the polonium. And this speaks also of an instantaneous creation. And these are just a few samplings that if you get into the subject, uh, be prepared to dig deeply because most of what we've been taught in schools is myths and legends and falsehoods. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And uh, so there's a, this happens to include a Hebrew phrase that's been the subject of a great deal of provocative speculation. Without form and void in the Hebrew is tohu vibohu, without form and void. The problem is, is that when you get to Isaiah 45, 18, you find an interesting verse. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it, He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And there's the same word there, is that uh, He created it not uh, tohu vobohu. So there seems to be a contradiction here. And whenever you find a contra apparent contradiction in the Scripture, rejoice, because there may be a discovery hidden behind that. The other problem with this verse is the, is the uh, word was. It happens to be a transitive verb. It's a, it really should be translated became. It implies somebody being the result of an action. Um, an example of that in, it, we find later in Genesis where Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. The, word, the same word. It, it applies action on a direct object. And so when you put this all together, uh, the way some people would translate this verse, the first verse, no problem. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. New subject. But, and that's another issue, the conjunction there is an adversive conjunction. In other words, both the Septuagint in the Greek and also the Latin Vulgate make that point. It's not and that's neutral, but it's, it's an adversative conjunction. So it should be translated, but the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And because of this possibility, this is controversial, so I don't want you to necessarily buy into it, just be aware of this uh, uh, viewpoint, uh, but there is a view by some scholars that there is a gap implied between verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Great, no problem. But the earth became without form and void, and darkness is on the face of the deep, maybe for eons. And darkness, and, and the Spirit of God hovered or brooded over the face of the waters. And one of the questions that this, uh, this, was, this view I'm suggesting here was originally proposed by Thomas Chalmers in 1814, and these views are supported by people like G. H. Pember, Donald Gray Barnhouse, G. Campbell Morgan, Arthur Constance, and uh, others. It's highly speculative, but it does seem to tie with some other scriptures. And one of the issues it needs to deal with, it has nothing to do with dinosaurs and that sort of thing. We'll come to that. But it does raise a possibility, because one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, when did Satan fall? When we get to chapter 3 of Genesis, he's already a fallen creature. We know he wasn't always fallen uh, when, we studied, uh, when we study Isaiah and Ezekiel and other sources of information about him. So one of the questions is, when did he fall? And the suggestion is maybe there was some incidence between verse 1 and 2, and, and because these terms without form and void are always dealt that, that where they occur elsewhere, it's, it's without form and void as a form of judgment. So there's, there are all kinds of conjectures that come out of that. Be careful with those, but uh, recognize that there are, are these strange views. But the first direct quote of God in the Scripture is the third verse. God said, let light be, is what He actually said. Let, let there be light, and there was light. And uh, so it's interesting that light itself is one of the most profound mysteries in science. And uh, it's, uh, the speed of light is usually uh, represented by the letter C for, uh, uh, by tradition. Uh, measurements of the speed of light um, are, are uh, in themselves an interesting controversy. See, in the 17th century, uh, Kepler and Descartes and so forth, the experts in that day, believed that light was instantaneous, or putting it another way, that the speed of light was infinite, very high, very fast. And that was the conventional wisdom. But in 1677, a Danish astronomer by the name of Olaf Romer measured the elapsed time between eclipses of Jupiter with one of its moons. And there's ways to do that at different places in, the, in its orbit. 
it, it, which gives you a way of measuring the speed of light over very large distances. And by arra- t- taking advantage of that, he measured the speed of light and discovered it was finite. And uh, uh, he was poo-pooed by the physicists for 50 years. They laughed at this foolishness that the speed of light had, was finite, a finite number. It was an Englishman by the name of James Bradley, 60 years later, that confirmed Romer's work. And it was generally accept, very reluctantly accepted by the physics community that, life, that uh, light had a, a finite speed. Over the last 300 years, the speed of light has been measured at least 164 times by 16 different methods, and as we examine the data for that, we find some surprising things. There's a delightful friend of mine by the name of Barry Setterfield in Australia that more than 10 years ago uh, uh, explored this issue and published some papers in this area, and he was joined by Trevor Norman. Barry Setterfield and Trevor Norman did an analysis. What they did is they gathered the raw data from these classic experiments through history, and they had examined them carefully, and they discovered Romer's information with the Io eclipse. Uh, his measurement that uh, concluded that the speed of light was 307,600 uh, kilometers per second with an error band of about 5,400 kilometers either way. And okay, in 1875, two centuries later, Harvard University, using essentially the same method, uh, measured it, and it was 299,921 meter kilometers per second with an error band of only 13, because obviously technology had improved in those two centuries. And uh, in 1983, the National Bureau of Standards, using a laser technique, measured the speed of light as 299,792.4586 plus or minus 0. 0.00003 kilometers per second. In other words, very, very small error band. But what's interesting, if you exam- stand back and examine these numbers, you'll notice that the means don't even overlap, that Harvard's analysis fell outside the error band of Romer's and all the way down. So uh, a Canadian mathematician by the name of Alan Montgomery uh, analyzed all this data statistically, and he also concluded that the speed of light's been slowing down. In fact, it follows a cosequence squared curve with better than a 99% uh, correlation factor. Now, this implies that the speed of light's been slowing down. And if you go backwards and say, okay, what, what was it earlier? It was apparently 10 to 30 percent faster in the time of Christ. It was twice as fast in the days of Solomon. It was four times as fast in the days of Abraham and 10 million times faster prior to 3000 BC. And incidentally, there are similar trends in 475 me- measurements of 11 other atomic quantities by 25 different methods that imply the same thing. It's interesting that uh, some years ago, of course, we uh, developed a friendship with Barry Setterfield and we uh, included many of these discoveries in our materials and got a lot of guffaws from some of my friends, Christian physicists, that um, felt that they tried to advise Chuck, don't buy into that, that's foolishness. Any physicist knows that the speed of light's a constant, it's not variable. And we caught a lot of criticism from some of these friends for a number of years, better part of, more, ten, better part of 10 years. But in the last two years, there have been a number of articles in reputable scientific journals where they have now discovered the speed of light is not a constant. One of the things that disturbs me about these articles that you find in the press is there are many of them now that recognize the reality that the speed of light is a variable and has been slowing down. What's disturbing that none of them acknowledge the pioneering work of Barry Setterfield and Trevor Norman, who've taken this abuse over the decades. You'll discover that physicists cling to their beliefs with the same tenacity that theologians do. And uh, it's not at all objective. But let's get into some other confirmations. Uh, the French Astronomical Journal uh, back in 1927 uh, saw, suggested some of these things. Tom Flandern at the U.S. Naval Observatory noticed that the atomic clocks are slowing down relative to orbital clocks. And there's some uh, uh, Russians also that have published in this area independent of Setterfield. So this is not uh, a harebrained idea of a couple of Australians. Uh, it's uh, very real. Now, the, the, ti- the definition of time itself changed in 1967. Up until 1967, a second of time was defined in terms of one Earth orbit around the sun, a small fraction of that, obviously. After 1967, the second was redefined as a number of oscillations of the cesium-133 atom. And uh, see, if atomic clocks are correct, then the orbital speeds of Mercury and Venus and Mars are increasing, which of course is impossible. 
If the gravitational constant is truly constant, then atomic vibrations and the speed of light are decreasing. And see, if a planet's orbital speed is increased, it would violate the law of conservation of energy. If atomic clocks are correct, the gravitational constant would change, and no such variations have been detected. So this has some profound implications in terms of the very fabric of our reality here. See, if atomic frequencies are decreasing, then five properties of the atom, such as Planck's constant and others, would also be changing. And statistical studies support both the magnitude and direction of these changes. And so, there's another thing that's happening in the field of physics you should be sensitive to. All this, will, bear with me, this all will affect your perspectives as you read. The more you know about what's going on in science, the more comfortable Genesis 1 reads. There's a thing called Hubble's Law. That's why the, the, the space telescope was named after Edwin Hubble. The, the Hubble's Law, because they observe that the spectra, the light spectra of stars, shift to the red, and apparently shifts to the red in proportion to its distance away, they've always assumed that that was like a Doppler effect. A siren sounds higher pitches comes at you and lower pitches it moves away. They call that the Doppler effect in, in sound. They felt the same things happening with light, that the light shifted to the red because these things are moving away from us, longer wavelength. Except a couple of guys, Halton Arp in Germany and William Tift in the University of Arizona have spent the last several decades collecting data, precise data, about the red shifts. And they've discovered that some of them aren't so well behaved. See, Hubble's law postulated that the, this whole idea that the red shift is caused by uh, ex an expanding universe. And that's why he's honored by the space telescope being named after him and so forth. He except William Tift has discovered that the red shifts are quantized. They're always a multiple of a definitive number. In other words, sort of like the keys of a piano. You can only get certain keys by hitting the key, unlike a violin where you can get any tone you want. A piano, you've got discrete uh, choices. Uh, the shred, red shift is, has that character, in other words, it's digital. And so it turns out that the red shift may actually be evidence of a change in the fabric of space itself. It's an atomic effect rather than a recessional velocity effect. That's just a conjecture at this point, but uh, you should understand the whole field of astronomy is based on Hubble's law and the rug's been pulled out from under that. Well, going on in Genesis, uh, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness, and He called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the day one. The subsequent days are relative, second day, third day, fourth day, but this one has a unique designation. It is the first in existence, the first day one. And uh, also God divided the light from the darkness. We could talk a lot about that. Most of us think that uh, darkness is simply the absence of light, except now we discover that darkness itself has a property. That's why we have black holes. It has a, you can have a gravitational effect out of which no light can emerge. So it's not as simple as it first seems. But there's another thing I want to call your attention to. It says the evening and the morning were day one. The word evening in Hebrew is erev, and the word morning is bokar. And we understand evening and morning, to, uh, the Erev and Boker to be evening and morning, because that's its usage in modern Hebrew. But we'll run into a strange event when we get to the seventh day, because there is no evening and morning. And that's a clue, perhaps, that the word Erev and Boker in its original context w meant something other than evening and morning and came to mean evening and morning subsequently. Let's explore these two terms a little more carefully, because neither of these occur on the seventh day. Erev actually speaks to obscuration, uh, like a mixture. Like it, 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 uh, mathematically, it's increasing entropy. When encroaching darkness began to deny our ability to discern forms or shapes and identities, hence um, this is, became a term for twilight, a time of approaching darkness or ambiguity, confusion. So Erev had its initial concept of obscuration, and that's what's a natural term for evening twilight, if you will. And uh, so at sunset, that marks the duration of, uh, of, uh, of impurity, when a ceremonially unclean person became clean again, and uh, so forth. So we'll discover that the, the demarcation in the Hebrew world was Erev, the evening, not midnight or morning as we think of it in, in, in our world. So the Erev became the beginning of the Hebrew day, but it's a term for evening because it's a time when there's encroaching darkness and, and so forth. Okay. The word boker is just the opposite. Boker really means becoming discernible, distinguishable, visible, the perception of order. It's as if you're getting up in the morning and you can begin to see 
gee, there are things out there. You're, let's say if, you, if, you've, if you've ever uh, 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 arrived very late at night at some strange place and went to bed, then in the morning you get up and you look around and you begin, wow, I didn't know that mountain was there. That, you, 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 as, as the light comes, you can begin to discern. So that's, a form, that's mathematically a form of decreasing entropy, of decreasing randomness. So it has an attendant ability to discern forms, shapes, distinct identities, breaking forth of light and revealing things in effect. So that's why it comes to mean dawn or morning. I'm going to suggest to you that these terms have a more fundamental meaning and have come to colloquially mean uh, evening and morning. So we need to understand there are uh, one of the sciences that's emerging in modern times is probably the most telling of all the sciences, and that's the information sciences. As we, uh, as we understand commu uh, communication theory, information theory with computers and the rest, uh, and that's been, of course, my personal field of specialization. We obviously can think of disorder and order. We all know what order looks like. We know what disorder look like, uh, looks like. On a Saturday, you clean up the closet. Or at school, you clean up your locker every once in a while. You go from the confusion, you try to get things a little bit more organized, or a woman's purse, <laughs> whatever. So there's a, there's a thing called noise, useless change, in contrast to signal, which is carrying information. See, on the right side here, whether it's order or signal, that's information. Disorder or noise is randomness or entry. Cacophony, sounds that make no sense at all, in contrast to organized sounds, which we call music. There's chaos, in contrast to cosmos. And uh, the word Greek word cosmos is uh, used of the world, for example, but means to bring order out of chaos. It's the root, of course, to the word cosmetics, but I won't go there. We'll move on here. So on the left side, you've got disorder, noise, cacophony, chaos. That's uh, forms of randomness. On the right side, you've got order, signals, music, cosmos itself, design. So the disorder, to co the collective term for that is entropy, randomness, confusion. And contrast that, you have information, things that, are, that carry intelligence. And the direction is always in the direction of entropy. Things are always winding down. It's as if the entire universe is like a clock that's been wound up that's winding down. We always go from order to disorder. You have to put energy in to go the other way. The natural trend is, to, is towards entropy. And uh, when you take information and add confusion to it, or you put some noise into it, it degrades in the direction of entropy. And uh, so, if we do an entropy profile of the universe, I'm going to have entropy going upside down. En uh, maximum entropy is the bottom of this chart, and order is at the top, if you will. And so, entropy is going downhill, order is going uphill, okay? And so, we have Erev, which is obscurity and disorder, which later comes to mean evening, and Boker, which means orderly, it's discernible, that's uh, morning. And it's my suspicion that Erev and Boker define discrete steps in defining uh, 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 creation, creation. And uh, so uh, uh, you, uh, w we have the view that there was an event that caused a disruption between the spiritual and physical world. I'll come to that shortly. And, but it's interesting, when you get to day seven, the Hebrew translation of that passage, and the Onkelos translation, is that God imposed a unified order on the universe on day seven. And uh, so, and it's of course in day one that li the, fr the main creation in day one is let light be, okay? And so, uh, well, that's day one. Let's go to day two, or second day more precisely. And God said, let there be a firmament. That is a strange word, we'll come to that in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. It was so. God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. The outer heaven book were the second day. Now the word for firmament is rakia, and it's a strange word. In the Hebrew, rakia means an extended surface. It's an expanse, but it's a solid expanse. That's the emphasis of the word. In the Greek translation, Asteroma also means firmness, and it's from that the Latin got firmamentum, which, from which we get the word uh, firmament, which means a three-dimensional solidity or firm expanse. And that sounds like a contradiction, because it's, it's, it's firm and yet it's, 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 it's term, we would say space, but it's not empty. So that's the second day, and we have, I, when it speaks of waters, by the way, I suspect that what it's dealing with is what's called in rhetoric a stenectiki. 
Often you put the general for the specific or the specific for the general. For example, you say, uh, speaking of, of a very good house uh, uh, hospitality, uh, she sets a fine table. You don't mean literally the table, you mean the whole cuisine. See, that's an example in rhetoric where you use the specific to mean the general. And, uh, uh, or, boy, so-and-so's got some neat wheels, meaning his car. See, we use those snack thingies all the time. When it says waters, I think it's talking about fluids. And one of the things most of us think of matter as having three states, gas, liquid, or solid. There's a fourth state of matter, plasma before gases, and then gases to liquids to solids. Or going the other way, from solid to liquid to gas to plasma, where you've got disassociated atoms. And I believe that's what's really what's in view here. Is this more than a metaphor? All through the Scripture, it speaks of the heavens being stretched. God stretches out the heavens, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain. You can't stretch out empty space. That doesn't make sense. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He stretched out the heavens. The Lord who stretches out the heavens in Zechariah. And we could go on with dozens of verses that are consistent in presenting this uh, 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 rather fluid role there. And we now discover, by the way, that empty space as we, is really an oxymoron. Space is not, is not an empty vacuum. It can be torn, according to Isaiah 64. It can be worn out like a garment. Space can be worn out like a garment in Psalm 102. It can be shaken. How do you shake empty space? Hebrews 12, Haggai 2, Isaiah 13. It can, it, it can and will be burnt up, according to 2 Peter 3. In Revelation 6, we say it says it's split apart like a scroll. That's interesting. It can be rolled up like a mantle, according to Hebrews 1 and Isaiah 34, or a scroll. Now that rolled up is a clue here. In order for something to be rolled up, there must be a dimension in which it is thin. You can take a map and you can roll it up. That's because it's thin and it also a two-dimensional map needs a third dimension to be rolled up. So this is a hint of another dimension. Space can be bent. So there must be a direction that it can be bent toward. And uh, so thus there are addi additional spatial dimensions. And so we just know this from the, the, the biblical text, but we also know it uh, as we understand what the physics tell, physicists tell us about our universe, is that we now know that we live in more than three dimensions. In fact, more than four, counting time as one of those dimensions. In fact, the current conjectures that we live in at least ten different dimensions. So Nachmanides in the 12th century, by studying de Genesis chapter 1, concluded that the universe has ten dimensions and only four are directly knowable. That was his uh, uh, comments in his commentary on, on Genesis. Well, it's interesting that we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover the same thing. Particle physicists in the 20th century have concluded, uh, since about 1984, that we live in at least ten dimensions. Four directly measurable, three spatial dimensions, length, width, height, and time, and uh, six other dimensions are curled, as they would say in vector calculus, curled less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and therefore they're only inferable by indirect means. And I think it's funny that we spent all this money on atomic accelerators to learn what Nachmanides did by doing his homework in Genesis 1. But moving on, let's talk a little about the atom. Most of us had some exposure to the atom. We think of the simplest atom, which is hydrogen. It has a nucleus and has an electron running around it in the, in the conventional representation of that. But uh, there's a nucleus and there's a, a, an electron or more. And they're obviously in balance, uh, plus and minus wise. The difference, the amount of space there, linearly, is about 10 to the minus 5. If you take that volumetrically, that means that for every part that is particle there, you have 10 to the 15th emptiness. 10 to the 15th is a big number. If we were going to build a model of the atom, uh, and we're going to let the, uh, the uh, nucleus be the size of a pinhead, the electron would be a football field away, literally 100 meters away. So uh, an atom is mostly empty space. There's only one part in 10 to the 15th that is, in some sense, solid. But because of the electrical effects, the, it creates the illusion of being, of having physical properties. And so we have uh, H2O, where uh, oxygen captures two hydrogen atoms, or we have uh, other atoms where the, the whole hydrocarbon world is one of, of chaining these, these atoms by the electrical interactions of the atoms themselves, by imbalances. And so, uh, so uh, what seems to be suggested I I is in the first uh, early days of Genesis is that we had plasmas. They hadn't even formed molecules yet. And we have the properties of space. By the way, something else I should go on to. Space has properties. 
It has an electrical property called permittivity. It has permeability. It has a dielectric constant and it has a magnetic constant. There is an intrinsic impedance to spa in space. Any radio amateur who's been trying to tune an antenna knows that space itself has an intrinsic impedance. And uh, these things are all now well understood. And uh, of course the, uh, the velocity of light as we talked about uh, uh, at creation was probably uh, uh, 2.54 times 10 to the 10th times its present velocity. It's currently uh, 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 also at the speed of gravity, which is a whole other thing to get into. Let's talk a little bit about zero point energy. Um, this is a, uh, what's astonishing. If the temperature of an empty container is lowered to absolute zero, there still remains a residual amount of thermal energy that cannot by any means be removed. That's why they call it the zero point energy. And a, a vacuum. An absolute vacuum is now known to be a vast reservoir of seething energy out of which particles are being formed and annihilated constantly. It's sort of like the foam at the, at the base of a waterfall. And uh, see, one of the questions is why doesn't an electron that's is spinning around its nucleus of an atom radiate its energy away and by losing that energy spiral into the nucleus? It's a question. The answer is it picks up energy from the background zero point energy and therefore is sustained by it. And that's exactly what's suggested in 1 Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 16, incidentally. But let's keep moving here. Day one, let light be. Second day, the stretching out of space. The third day, we find land and vegetation. Now that's kind of exciting. So Erev and Boker on the third day leads to the land and vegetation. There's something else behind the text without getting into the land vegetation thing itself. Uh, you can get plenty of that from your biology books and so forth. But, and God said, Let, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, this is skimming down to verse 29 now, which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. And it goes on at the end of that chapter to the beginning of the next chapter. It says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it goes on. Between these two verses, verse 29 of chapter 1 and verse 9 of chapter 2, is obviously uh, some uh, Hebrew text of a handful of verses in which is encrypted the name of 25 trees that appear in the Bible. It's interesting that if you use, they, they, using a computer they discovered that these 25 trees are encrypted. Some very shortly, every second, using every second letter, every third letter, that, forward or backward, whatever. But it's interesting that these trees are the trees that are mentioned elsewhere in the Scripture. They're all encrypted underneath the text that deals with the, the uh, uh, seed-bearing trees. And uh, so... Uh, What's relevant here isn't the fact these words happen to occur. What's relevant here is they're clustered under the text that has re relevance here. So it's an interesting form of authentication, that, as we talked about earlier. Let's skip on to the fourth day. It's sort of startling to realize that the sun is created in day four, the plants and vegetation in day three. That makes it pretty hard to explain these as geological eras, by the way. Uh, and also it uh, indicates that maybe there's other sources of light but, but, uh, before the sun, but let's not get into all that here. Uh, Erev and Boker, again, we have the sun, the planets, the stars, and all of that. And uh, there's much we could talk about here, but let's just pick verse 14 out of this series. God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for what? For signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and He made the stars also. And the Erev and the Boker were the fourth day. As we look through a telescope, we see a number of galaxies. And there's a handful of these that are spiral galaxies. And I've put a few on the screen here. And by me making distance measurements, we estimate that the one in the upper left is about 2 million light years away. Uh, the next one to the right of it is 18 million light years away. The one to the right of it is about 25. Light years are measurements of distance, by the way. It's how far light can travel in a year. And uh, uh, a standard astronomical measurement of distance. Uh, the one in the lower left is uh, 32 million light years away. Uh, the next one, 65 million, and the one in the lower right, 106 million light years. Now, what's interesting about these, you'll notice that these spiral arms of the galaxies are roughly, uh, they're all very similar. That poses an interesting question about galaxy twist. The galaxies that were furthest away had to release their light 
long before the, early, the, the closer galaxies, because light had to go further away, so they had to start earlier. Therefore, the further galaxies did not have as much time to rotate and twist their arms. Thus, the closer galaxies should have the most twist. But we find that's not the case. If the speed of light was a million times faster in the past, that would account for them being so similar. I set that out as a suggestion. But let's get back to verse 14, because there's something else hidden under this one. God said, Let their lights be in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and for years. This word for seasons is hamoyedim in the, in the Hebrew. The appointed times. What's interesting, they've taken a computer and they've looked at the, entire, the 78,000 letters in the book of Genesis, and the frequency of those letters in the Hebrew alphabet would imply that that word should just show up randomly by accident about five times in 78,000 letters. But what they discover is astonishing. As an equidistant letter sequence, it appears only once in the entire book of Genesis and it's at an interval of 70, and it is centered on verse uh, Genesis 1.14. And uh, now why is this so significant? Well, first of all, by the way, the odds of this happening exactly this way is like 1 in 70 million. It's a, it, it statistically doesn't make sense unless it was deliberate. It turns out to any Jew, he knows that of the appointed times, there are 70 of them, 52 Sabbaths a year, plus 7 additional Sabbaths per year. Many people don't realize that there's uh, 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 more than just the 52 Sabbaths. Seven days of Passover, including its related feast. It says Passover, they're using it connotatively to include Feast of First Fruits and, fe and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, there's the Feast of Shavuot, there's the Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur, and uh, seven days of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And when you add those, uh, when you add up, there, it adds up to 70. There are 70 appointed times in, in, on the Hebrew calendar. And so it's fascinating to discover that the text itself echoes this that the Hamoyadim. Uh, is encrypted underneath the text uh, in an interval of 70, uh, once and only once, centered on that verse. Again, these are not, you can't build big cases on this except they're forms of authentication. You get, you see evidence of a designer hovering over this text. And uh, Rabbi Hirsch said many years ago, uh, the Jews' catechism is this calendar. And uh, what did he mean by that? Well, of course, we have the Feasts of Israel. Uh, the, the, in the first month of the religious year, we have the spring feast, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. Seven months later, you have the fall feasts in the, in the month of Tishri, Feast of Trumpets on the first of that, the Yom Kippur on the tenth of that month, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot uh, on the fifteenth. And between these two groups on the first and seventh, there's a very strange one, the Feast of Weeks. It's a, it, it, in which they used leavened bread, strangely enough. And, it, and each one of these feasts, we'll discover later as we get into this, are not only commemorative historically, they're also prophetic. The first three were fulfilled on Christ's first coming. The last three, apparently, will be fulfilled on His second coming. And there's a very interesting one between those two. But let's move on. On the fifth day, we have the sea animals uh, and, and birds uh, uh, created. And boy, if you... Yeah, again, this is so frustrating to go through this because each one of these subjects is elegantly uh, 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 illuminates the skill of the designer. Uh, you can take something as trivial as a bird's feather and you can spend a whole evening on discovering how skillfully that's designed. And to attribute that to happenstance or accident is nonsense. But we won't get into all that here. The real death of Darwinism comes uh, from lots of reasons, but not the least of which is microbiology. Advances in microbiology, namely the DNA and all that, have dealt the death blow. They put the final nails in Darwin's coffin in a sense. Because the DNA that we now discover is a three out of four error correcting code. And we have time to develop that, but it's, it, it's just utterly absurd to attribute the elegance of that code to random chance. And when you design a computer, you've got to have the language and the machinery processing that language intimately coordinated. To ascribe either one or certainly together as randomness is, uh, follow, is, the, is absolute folly in, in logic. And uh, Darwinism cannot explain uh, the origin of life because it cannot explain the origin of information. And uh, it, there's another concept that's emerging called irreducible complexity. We're indebted to Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box, where he illustrates this idea with a simple mousetrap. Here we have a mousetrap that has uh, five parts. It has a basic platform on which there's a hammer. That hammer is driven by a spring. 
It's held back by a holding bar that's tucked under a catch. All of us are familiar with a mousetrap. And uh, what's interesting, there are five parts here. Trying to make this simpler is pretty futile. It's, it's, uh, these five parts have to be there in some function or another. It's interesting that if you have only four of the five parts, you don't catch four-fifths as many mice, you catch zero. The point is there's a concept in design called irreducible complexity. It can't get simpler than this. That indicates it's designed. It can't happen by accident. And let's take a, a single-celled creature called a bacteria, uh, a bacteria. It has a flagellum, a little tail that propels it through its fluid. And if you look at this carefully, all we're, gonna, we're not going to get into all the other details. This is a single-celled animal. And we're going to just look at where the flagellum is connected to the creature. And we discover there are 40 parts to an electric motor. It doesn't wiggle, it spins. And it, it is an elegantly designed motor with 40 critical parts, any one of which missing it doesn't work. So this did not happen by chance. It evidences uh, designs, highly skillful design. And so uh, uh, we won't get uh, here into all that detail. But then we get, of course, to the next day. We have animals, and uh, the sixth day we have animals, mammals, and, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Man uh, created in day six. And uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, most of us are victims of this nonsense promoted by our textbooks and even in National Geographic and Scientific American publish these crazy things, the soul I, th that we came from monkeys and that nonsense. When you get into this and study it with any uh, depth at all, you'll discover something astonishing. Not only is this nonsense, it's deliberate fraud. The Heidelberg man was contrived from a single jawbone. The Nebraska man in 1922, Henry Osborne, did it from just one tooth. And they later discovered that it was from an extinct pig. The Piltown man you hear so much about. Charles Dawson developed this from the jawbone of a modern ape. It was deliberate fraud. We now know it was filed and treated with iron salts to look old. Uh, if you get to the Peking man in 1921, the evidence has disappeared, but it also bears evidence of an outright fraud. These are not people who made a discovery and were just misguided. These are people who deliberately contrived these things to be misleading. The Neanderthal man, found in the cave in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. At the International Congress of Zoology in 1958, they concluded that it was just simply an old man suffering from arthritis. The Java man, 1922, uh, in 1891, uh, skull cap, uh, a 50-foot femur thigh bone that was not, was not even near it, was distant from it, and the, the evidence was concealed. It was teeth of a, uh, an orangutan. The thing that disturbs you about paleontology is it's littered with deliberate frauds, not just poor science, but deliberate frauds. So all this is can still, you'll still find in the textbooks used in your schools to mislead our kids. In 120 years of searching, there have been no intermediate stages found to justify evolution. We could go on and on, but let's move on here. We get to day seven, the seventh rest, the seventh day rest. And you'll notice there's no Erev and Boker. There's no discrete steps. God had finished His creation. He's, it's completed. That's the whole theme of day seven. And there's no Erev on the, uh, or Boker. For now our problem in this so-called day, how old is the universe in the days, it's clear that God intended us to understand that. And our problem is not Genesis 1. People talk about the word yom and what it might mean. That's silliness. It's Exodus 20, verse 11, where the creator of the universe with his own finger wrote it in stone. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. And incidentally, he didn't do that in Exodus 20. He did that in Genesis uh, 1. And so... Uh, so our problem isn't in, in grasping the six-day thing. It's clear God intended us to understand that He did it in six days. And uh, in, in days as we think of them. I won't qu quibble about 24-hour business, but clearly it's, it's a day-by-day -day thing. And the real mystery to those that really understand who God is, is why did He take six days? But in any case, that's what He chose to do, and He did. The field of thermodynamics has been really solidified in 125 years. It's been fully described. And the first law of... Uh, of thermodynamics is called the conservation of matter and energy. It asserts that matter and energy, they can equivalent, they're equivalent to each other, uh, can neither be created nor destroyed under natural circumstances. And nowhere in the universe is matter being created or annihilated. All observed processes in the universe conserve matter or its equivalent energy. And uh, the corollary to this is natural processes cannot create energy. All of this is a result 
of a creation of the past. That's the implication of the first law. And you can also say there's no way to win. In other words, the matter and energy uh, is, is, is uh, you can't create either one of them. And uh, it's interesting, that's exactly what the Scripture says in Genesis 2. We just In the seventh day, God ended His work. And uh, that's a thermodynamic statement. The works were finished from the foundation of the world in the book of Hebrews and so forth. All things that were therein, you preserve them all. Nehemiah 9, 6, and it's all through the Scripture. Well, there's a second law of thermodynamics, and that's what we call the entropy laws, the second law, the bondage of decay. First law says there's no way to win. The second one says you can't even break even. What it really means is there's an arrow of time. It asserts that as time advances, the universe progresses from a state of order to a state of disorder. And we find that in our closets at home. Clean up the garage and see how long it lasts. Uh, uh, locker at school, what have you. There's always a trend, trend towards randomness. And that's true of all uh, pro- uh, processes. And uh, the uh, universe seems to run downhill to eventually a heat death uh, when no temperature differences exist and therefore no energy is available for, for work. And uh, this means, looking back, that the universe had a beginning because uh, the total has been limited. And uh, there's a third law that no one talks about much in, except in uh, thermodynamics, and that's where every substance has a positive um, entropy, which may become zero at absolute zero, which means you can't get out of the game, but uh, we won't get into that here. Uh, entropy in Scripture. They shall perish, thou shalt grow old as a garment, in Psalm 102. The earth will grow old like a garment, in Isaiah 51. Heaven and earth will pass away, Matthew 24. And uh, now... Is entropy going to be repealed? This is one reason a number of us believe that the entropy laws were introduced in Genesis 3. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of decay. And we believe that's an allusion to the entropy laws and obtain the glorious liberty of the, of the children of God. So, heat always flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. If the universe was infinitely old, then the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. It's obviously not, so therefore it's not infinitely old. That's a simple demonstration. The universe had a beginning and is destined, by the way, for an ending. Scientists will talk about the Big Bang as a, as a singularity that started all this, and it will ultimately reach the end of a, a uniform temperature, which they call the heat death. But there's finite boundaries when it began, and there is an end at which it will end. Now, as, as you can probably gather, this is kind of a frustrating exercise to go through uh, these, these uh, six days, because we spend an, uh, a full session on each one in our commentary in Genesis. We have a commentary in Genesis in, which has 24 sessions for the entire book, and just the book. And then Monday we go through the big main models, the fabric of space, hyperdimensions, and all of that. And uh, Tuesday we have life and vegetation. We talk about the origin of life, thermodynamics, and entropy, and molecular chemistry. And the fourth day we have the, the uh, stars and the planets. We refute the so-called nebular hypothesis. We talk about the anthropic principle and uh, the signs in the heavens and such. In the fifth day of the fish and fowl, we talk about the fallacy of evolution. It's obviously shredded very easily. And the evidences of the design everywhere and biodiversity and its role. And the sixth day, we have, of course, the fallacies and frauds I've alluded to, but also the DNA and the role of information in life. And thus, out of that, the architecture of man. Not his physical architecture, his software architecture. And the seventh day, of course, anyone that thinks the seventh day issue is a simple one hasn't studied it. And there are clearly six steps of entropy reduction to get to the seventh day. Then a repose is established on the universe. We'll talk about the Sabbath in prophecy, and that may surprise many Christians are confused on this point. That doesn't put us under the law, but there are some issues that might be quite uh, provocative. And the role of marriage in all of this. But let's uh, wrap this up with Genesis chapter 3, which ju- is, is the seed plot of the entire Bible, where the Nachash, the shining one, uh, presents to Eve the forbidden fruit, and she yields, and that... We need to study that carefully to understand the methodology of deception. His first step was to suggest to Eve, yea, hath God said? To create doubt that that's really what God said. That's exactly what it will do with each one of us. The first step in deception is to create doubt about what God really said. God means what He said and says what He means. And then from that, of course, the next step is denial. Ye shall not surely die, He suggests, and on they go. So, and that, uh, from, from the fall of man, we have the, God's declaration of war. God takes the initiative of the war against Satan, and he alludes to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's two seeds. The seed of the, ser- uh, the woman becomes a, ti- a messianic title of the deliverer, of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. But there's also a seed of a serpent that will make his day. And the key verses here in chapter 3 are verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said unto the serpent, or the Nachash, the shining one, 
Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And there are the two seeds. The seed of the woman being the title of Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent being this leader that is yet to surface on the, in world history. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, the entropy, the bondage of decay, we believe is introduced here. So we've, se we've seen the, e the, the order improve through the creation week and sta stabilize during the seventh day. But then we have this pivotal event called the fall of man in which God puts a curse on the creation. We need to understand that everything we know about the universe, we know from a post-curse universe. We know it only since the curse has been instituted. We have only glimpses or conjectures of what happened prior to the fall. You can't prove to me that Adam and Eve lived only in three dimensions. Uh, this is all a byproduct of the curse. And so, the effects of the fall. The entropy, I think, was introduced. The universe fractured. Maybe this is where we separate the, from the ten dimensions to the four that we can directly experience, separating the physical and the spiritual universe. If we imagine, if, if I can make a two-dimensional representation of a ten-dimensional universe, and God announces a curse and separates the six from the four, uh, the four dimensions that we can experience being what we call the physical universe, that fracture may be a result of the curse. And there will be a time that, uh, see, the four-dimensional universe that we experience is a subset of a much larger reality, and we know that from, from, uh, our, uh, from empirical data. And so we have the fracture. And redemption, by the way, God's plan of redemption involves more than man alone, because Isaiah twice in Revelation it, uh, uh, says, I, I create a new heavens and a new earth. So there's more than just man involved in all this. The first act of religion is in Genesis 3, verse 7. The eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. That may mean far more than we have any idea. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons or covering armor or something. A shagor means girdle or loin covering or belt or armor. And uh, so that was their attempt to cover themselves from their fall. But before the chapter ends, God teaches them more correctly. Adam also to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? Why did he do that? Because he was teaching them that only by the shedding of innocent blood would they be covered. And while that has a practical aspect that we grab immediately, there's a Levitical aspect there that, they, that they will, uh, there will be the, the shedding of innocent blood will be required to free them from the predicament that they're in. So the central theme, the Old Testament is the account of a nation. The New Testament is the account of a man produced by that nation. The Creator became a man and, and, and dwelt among us. And His appearance is the central event of all history. He died to purchase us, and He's alive today. And the most exalted privilege we can get is to know Him. And that's what the Bible really is all about. So the scarlet thread begins from the seed of the woman, the call to, we'll go to the call of Abraham, the tribe of Jew, the dynasty of David, finally the virgin birth in Bethlehem, and we'll go to another tree in another garden when Jesus Christ is uh, paid uh, for, uh, pays for the uh, uh, predicament that we've got ourselves in. So next time we'll move forward and go to the flood and all those events. We'll find that there's another decrease in entropy, uh, uh, increase in entropy, a decrease in order, because the flood changes far, is more, a lot more than just a lot of water. And we'll deal with the Cain and Abel genealogy of Noah, the flood of Noah, and the Tower of Babel in the next session, finishing unit one, which some people would call prehistory. The second unit would be the rest of the book, which deals with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. See you there.